I love that um, not everybody can be a foster parent, but everybody can do something. And uh, this year, for the first time, I'm going to be able to go to camp in June. Last year, uh, we were busy having a baby or something like that, and so I wasn't able to make it. But I'm excited uh, to go as a counselor, and I'm assuming that this is going to be the first of many years that I will be a counselor because everybody who's ever been to that camp, they're not just changing other people's lives, but their lives are equally changed. And um, I think it's an awesome run uh, camp and organization, well worth your time and energy and resources. So hopefully you guys uh, will will um, jump on board and, and become more involved in that capacity. You guys are my people. You know why you're my people? Because you guys are crazy enough to drive out in the weather. We live in Iowa. You know, I'm thinking we would have driven to something else, you know, like we, we are, are, are just crazy. And so I'm glad that you guys are here with me this morning. And uh, I am done with shoveling and snow blowing. I've done more of that um, these last few weeks than I have that I can re- probably remember in my entire life. And I don't own a snow blower, but I'm going to buy one at the end of this season. And it's probably going to sit in my garage for the next four years. But I'm going to have one. And I keep on going over to my neighbor's house, and I let myself in his garage, and I use his snowblower. So I'm thankful for a really great uh, neighbor, Chad. So Chad, I know you go to a different church, but thanks. I appreciate you and your snowblower mainly. <laughs> but uh, Tuesday, uh, you know, we had this big snow, Monday, Tuesday, whatever day it was. And, uh, or was it Sunday? It was Sunday. It was Sunday. It was, it was all of the above. It just all blends together. And uh, I did five driveways, and I ended at my parents' house doing their driveway because my dad was in Israel. I was helping my mom out, and, and I learned something about my dad um, that's just very interesting. I just want you to watch this video with me, if, if you will, this morning. So I was just snowballing my parents' house, and got done, came inside to take a shower before heading into work. I was in their bathroom, and I just thought I would share with you all the joys of having aging parents. My dad bought a three-pound jar of jelly bellies, and I think it's safe to say that he's officially entered geezerhood. (laughs) I'm telling you, this morning, Dad, I know that you're watching, and I know why you're sick. And it's not because you're sick, it's because you sit in the bathroom eating jelly bellies all the time. So... Your bellyache is caused rightfully so. You know, I just, I think of like old people and this, don't, I don't mean this to be rude or mean, but like as, as guys particularly, as they get older, they just stash candy in weird spots. I've, I've heard random stories of, of people, you know, taking locks off because they had Snickers in a drawer and, you know, Ken Johnson having all sorts of candy at church, you know, before he passed away and he passed it out to kids. My dad just chooses to keep his candy in the bathroom, which is kind of smart, you know. So it's good to be with you this morning. And uh, we are continuing in our series, Family Matters. And uh, we're going to be talking about values. And I think sometimes when we come to church and we have a sermon topic such as Family Matters, it's easy for those of uh, us that don't have a family, or maybe your family doesn't live around here, they're all raised, or you've been widowed, or, or um, whatever the circumstance is, just to kind of check out. But I want to let you know that this sermon is for everybody in here, whether you're close with your family, whether you don't have a family yet, whether you're the last one existing in your family, this, this sermon pertains to you. Why? Because we all value something. We all value something, and and if you want to know what you value in life, just take a quick second to ask yourself, what do you spend your time on? What do you spend your energy on? What do you spend your resources and your money on? And what do you spend the most amount of time thinking about? That will reveal to you what you value. And I think it's safe to say that if you're a parent, you spend a lot of time and resources on your kids. A lot of the decisions that you make are based on around your kids and the conversations that you're having are based around your kids. And if you're not a parent and you don't have kids, maybe it's based around a significant other or someone else that's involved in your life. And, and you, you spend all of your, your time around this individual or you're investing into this significant other. For me, myself, uh, I, I value my family. I, I value the calling on my life to be a pastor and a shepherd. I, I value the New York Yankees. 
I, I value the outdoors and spending time hunting and, and fishing. I value music. I value a lot of different things, but the thing that I value most, and I can honestly say this this morning, is I value God. And because I value God, I find myself valuing the things that God values. I value giving. I value forgiving. I value reconciling broken relationships. I, I value sticking up and being a voice for those who have no voice or those that find themselves in a vulnerable situation. I, I value those things. I value mission. Why? Because I value God and God's values become my value. Today's sermon is not deep theologically. In fact, it's a sermon that probably most of you have heard. And I want today to be served as a good reminder for us as, as we struggle because we have a heart that's bent towards sin to keep things in the correct order and, and the things that we value tend to get out of order. And so today, let it be a good reminder that we need to keep God as the thing that we value most. See, it's not what we value. It's not what we love. It's what we value and what we love most. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is asked a question, and he says, they, they ask him, what is, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. If you do not value God at the top of your priority, and if you don't love God more than everything else, in your entire life, you are missing out and everything about life is suffering. Your marriage is suffering, your relationships are suffering, your workplace is suffering, everything is suffering. And you might not even be aware that it's suffering, but once you step into a relationship with God and once you make God the center of it all, you'll begin to see a blessing that's unexplainable and that you won't be able to experience in any other capacity except by putting God at the center of it. And, and, and you might have a good uh, marriage. I'm not saying that if you don't love God with all of your heart that your marriage will just stink or that people at your, your work office will hate you or anything like that. But I am saying that there is a fullness of life. Jesus says that I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to bring life and life to the fullest. And so we need to understand that God is the one who breathes in his life and life to the fullest. And that's what I want for you this morning. I don't want you guys just to eke through life and live a good life or an okay life. I want you to live the best life. And that comes by placing God who brings life to the fullest, breathing life into our lungs where we can experience the absolute best in our marriages, relationships, work, everything, we can and you can experience the best if your priorities are set straight. This um, morning I've, I've got, as you can see, this, this illustration, and I'm sure many of you have seen this illustration before, but these things represent um, different things. This brick right here represents God because God should be the most important thing in our life. And this jar right here of rocks represent things that are real important, okay? This is family, this is work, this is different friends, relationships, this is sleep, things that are very, very important. And, and this sand right here, it represents things that um, have some value, but they're not as important, right? They're, they're still important, but not as, such as our hobbies. And, and this water right here represents um, things that just really don't have much value, you know, we have them in our lives, but there's not a, a huge benefit to them. And so, uh, such as social media or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is. And, and, and we see that if we start our morning and we start with the least important things in life, and the first thing we do is we grab our phone, we check our Instagram, we check our Facebook, we check whatever social media is, and we start with that. And, and then we, we go on to maybe a hobby or something that's... Um, not as important, then eventually in our day we get to the point of things that, that matter, but, you know, they're not as important as God, but this is family, this is work, and this is very important. And we get here, and soon we discover that by the time we fit everything in that we need to fit, we have no room for God. And now in, in our time, in our life, the thing that matters most has been neglected. But if we were to start our day and God be the first thing that we 
interact with and we wake up and we spend time in his presence and his word and then we begin to surround ourselves with the people and the things that matter most in life such as our family and our our job and our friends and things that that have a lot of value you see that we can fit all of this in here this is very difficult by the way so you should be impressed at what I'm, I'm able to accomplish. Get that in there. Last three. Now, we fit all that in there and we still have some time for our hobbies and things that we enjoy. And we're able to prioritize and we're able to enjoy life and, and have some things that, that are, are valuable, that we value, like my hunting or fishing or sports or music or whatever it might be. I'll tell you what, this whole week doing this illustration, finding sand in Iowa in the wintertime is a chore. I'll tell you that. And we fit all this sand in here and the things that matter a little bit. And we see that there's still room for things that don't matter as much. And this is slowly soaking in here. And if I were to take the time, this would continue to seep down, this would continue to fill up, and we'd be able to fit, oops, it doesn't matter because it's just social media. (laughs) Right? And what you can't see here is that there's these little bubbles that are rising to the surface and there's little pockets of air where this water is able to come in and and take place. You see, oftentimes we view our life as being too full for God and too full for things that really matter, but in reality, it's just our priorities are backwards. And I remember a time when I was a sophomore in college. I was taking 23 credits. It was eight classes. And that uh, semester, I made it a point to go to the chapel early every morning, 7 a.m. And honestly, there were times where I did more sleeping than praying. Just going to throw that out there. But I was in the chapel, and I'd spend anywhere from a half hour to 40 minutes just starting my day off in the presence of God and, and honoring God with my time. And that semester, I was able to to remain heavily involved with River Valley, which was a 25-minute drive one way south of Minneapolis, and and, and continue to serve multiple times a week there. I was able to have time for my friends. I was able to take naps, and I was able to, to, because naps are very important in college, uh, and I was able to pull all straight A's in, in all of those classes. And I don't credit myself because I'm not that smart. I'm not that talented, I'm not that disciplined, but the only thing that I can credit is Jesus Christ because as I honored him, he took my time and he stretched it. As I honored him, he gave me a concentrated mind and things that should have taken X amount of time only took this amount of time. And God, because I placed him at the front, honored me in all the things that he had called me to do and the things that I needed to do. And maybe you find yourself this morning and you just feel like, man, I'm just overcommitted. I don't have enough time. I don't have it. That might be the case. And there might be things that you need to let go of and you need to say no. But more likely the scenario is that maybe your priorities aren't straight and and we need to realign things and, and get them in the correct order this morning. Turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The author of Ecclesiastes, this is a very encouraging passage, I'm sure many of you know it, Um, but the author of Ecclesiastes was a man named Solomon, and God asked Solomon, what is it that you want? I'll, I'll give you one thing that you want, and what did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. And so instantly this man, Solomon, he was the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth, and he accumulated a massive amount of wealth. He had all sorts of relationships. He built all sorts of buildings, did incredible things, and and was the richest in all of Jerusalem. And he writes this book, Ecclesiastes, at the end of his life after he's amassed all of these things, and this is what he has to say. Would you stand with me as we read this word of God, Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 1 through 11, then we'll jump to chapter 2. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. 
Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye has never seen enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been, what has been will be again, and what has been done will, will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was already here long ago. It was here before our time, and there is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. Jumping to chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of trees in them. I made reservoirs of water grow. Uh, groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female s- slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I, I want to stop here and just address that. These slaves are treated differently than the slaves of recent years. These slaves were often in par- uh, included in part of an inheritance. They were treated oftentimes as, as uh, children in the thing, and so they were treated well. I'm not advocating for slaves, but I understand that sometimes if you're reading this in a context of the 1700s or the 1800s, it can have a very negative connotation. Uh, Solomon was not mistreating and, and using. Uh, he, these, these were people um, that were serving under his household and servants. So I, I want to just clear that up for anybody that might be wondering or might get hung up where the Bible supports slavery. Absolutely, no, it doesn't. Not true at all. Read, read it in context. Verse 8. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my work, and this was the reward for all of my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, that you would flow through me what you need to say. And Lord, I pray, God, as as I've been convicted in preparing this, that we wouldn't just be convicted and have a moment of discomfort, but that discomfort or that moment of conviction would lead to a life change by the restorative power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you find yourself a seat? Solomon was touted as the wisest man that ever lived, and he puts it all out there and pretty much claims that everything in life is completely meaningless. Now, that could be really uh, taken two ways, either as really depressing and a pessimistic statement, or it could be found as a relief. Because if we keep the main thing the main thing, then everything else in life becomes so insignificant in in the, the scope of eternity. We, we don't get our days ruined when something happens to someone um, or, or something because we understand that we are just pilgrims passing through, that we were not created to live life and plant life here on earth, but to live it, to steward it, and then we go on to our place of, of heaven. Your career will mean very little to you at the end of your life. I've never met an elderly person who's 70, 80, retired, and said, oh man, I just wish I would have worked harder in my life. You know, man, I just wish I would have spent more time at work and, and instead of spending time with my kids. No, the other way around. You, he, you hear people say, man, I just wish I would have invested in the relationships. I wish I would have invested more in my children, in my grandchildren. I had a very close friend who's now gone on to be with the Lord a number of years ago, Harold Fessler. He was 96 or 7 years old when he passed away. And, and when he, um, in, in the last few years, I'd spend time, a lot of time with him. And, and he said this, he says, I, I fear that I worked so hard. And, and this is a man who built a multi-million dollar business. He worked hard. 
And he would tell me stories where he was pulling 80 or 90 hours a week to build this, this, this business. And he said, I fear that all I've passed on to my son is the ability to work hard. And I didn't pour into him the things that I now see as valuable. And I don't want any of us to get our values mixed around where we're passing on things that don't really matter in the picture of eternity, but let's pass on Jesus to the people around us. Let's, let's build a kingdom in heaven, not here on earth. I've never been to a funeral where someone says, well, I just wish my dad would have bought me that one more toy. I wish, I wish my dad would have um, accumulated more wealth so he could have passed that on to me. I always hear, I owe to have one more cup of coffee with my mom. Just sit and talk with her. I owe to, to, to go one more time fishing with my dad and just to be with him. You see, Solomon understood this. He had all the wisdom in the world, and he had to go out and try and experience all of these things to come to the same conclusion that I'm telling you this morning in verses 10 and 11. He says, I denied myself nothing. I refused my heart new pleasure. I did all of these things. I built these buildings. I built these houses. And what came of it? It's all meaningless. It's all meaningless. This morning, I want to bring to your attention four things that we tend to value more than valuing God. And, and, and there might be things that I don't speak, but God is going to reveal things in our hearts that we have set in, in a, a wrong priority where we have given more value and we have shown more love than we do of our Heavenly Father. And maybe for some of you, uh, you're, you're just questioning. You're wondering. You're like, man, I, you know, I don't even know why I'm here. Uh, I don't even buy into Jesus. I don't even know if he was real and stuff. You know, Jesus is not intimidated by questions. He's not intimidated by, by any form of question or doubt that you have. In fact, I would venture to say this, the world needs more doubting Thomases. The world needs more people who will question and doubt, but then not just leave it at that, go searching for the answers, because there is truth, there is bedrock, there is stuff that you can stand on, but the problem is, is most of us ask these difficult questions, and we never go searching for that truth, and we just let it be. Don't insult God. Give him an opportunity to reveal to you the truth. So if you're wandering, if you've never even heard the voice of God, my prayer for you this morning is that you would hear it and, and that you would search for that. At the end of my sermon, we're going to re respond, and those responding, I'm going to ask to come forward to the altar, and we're going to sing this song, Build My Life, and it's going to be a song of de a declarative song where we're declaring that we are going to build our lives on Jesus Christ, and, and everything that we do and everything that we say revolves around Jesus and not a, a, around what we feel and find is fit. So let's be a church body that's committed to keeping the main thing the main thing. Amen? The first thing that we tend to value more than Christ is someone, and I think this manifests itself in a lot of different ways, um, but, but we become really good at making life decisions based upon what we feel is right for the people that we value most in our life. We, we tend to go places, accept jobs, move places, do all of these things based upon what seems right in our mind, in our heart, rather than inviting God into those decisions and saying, God, where would you have me live? God, where would you have me work? God, what activities do you want my children to be in? God, what, what about this? What about that? And, and we do a really good job of placing the needs of other people, particularly the people that we love most, in front of the needs and the wants of God. If you're a parent, it's easy to, to allow life's decisions to be dictated by the needs of your children. And we encourage them to do all sorts of things, and we want them to grow, and we want them to be exposed, and we want them to be well cultured and, and educated, and we, we want to encourage their unique giftings and, and, and everything in that. And, and I just want to remind you that if we make the children the center of our worlds, we are subliminally teaching them to make Jesus not the center of their world. And not only this, hear me parents, I've seen, I'm sick of hearing and seeing too many divorces that are happening after 20, 25, 30 years of marriage. And what's happening is that the parents are spending so much time focusing on their kids that they never spend any time together as a parent, and then they leave and they go off and they're empty nesters, and now you don't even know the spouse that you've been married to for the last 25 years because you're so 
focus on centering everything around your kids. We've got to stop that. We've got to turn those values around. The best things that you can do, Dad, for your kids is you love your wife with all of your heart. And you, uh, you yeah, you can clap at that. You, you speak into that, and you let the kids know that. One of the main reasons that there's disobedience and there's just different strife, I'm not, I'm not making this complete blanket statement, but I believe a large reason is because when there's an insecurity within the home of the husband loving the wife, the kids are going to act out in some fashion. I remember growing up in elementary, and it seemed like the kids that were the naughtiest and just in the trouble the most, those were the kids that had broken homes. Those were the kids that, that were having parents that just were not involved and, and not in that. So we've got to rise up, and we've got to be that example to the world that this is the value. This is who we value. It's easy for us to value our children and place them at the center. But I want to encourage you, as you encourage your kids, and, and as you allow them to, to, to find out what is it that you know, you were created, and what do you enjoy doing? If they're a musician, bring Jesus to the center of their musicianship. Say, God gave you this ability to create music. Now you glorify him in the ability to create music. If he's an athlete, if she's an athlete, bring Jesus into the center of their sports. The disciplines that are learned on a sports field are so easy to be transferred into spiritual truths. In, in victories, and losses, make it about Jesus, not about yourself and your, your self-identity. If your kid's a brain, you know, we've got some really bright kids. I wasn't one of them. My sister, she was, right? But if, if, if she was really smart and you've got a smart kid, encourage them that their brain can be used to bring glory to God because someday they'll come up with a cure and they can give glory to God. Someday they'll, they'll be able to take in difficult information and make it palatable for someone else to retain and become a teacher, and they can give glory to God. We have to do a better job as parents, as grandparents, of bringing Jesus to be the center of everything that our kids do. I'm not saying that you have to pull them or, or limit them, I, but I am saying that if Jesus isn't at the center, then, then we're teaching them something wrong. Here's another thing. This is just a little rabbit trail. I played varsity baseball and I never missed a Wednesday night, and I never was punished playing time. And it's not because I was the best, because I wasn't, although my dad would probably disagree. He thinks I am the best, but that's the dad's job, right? But I told my coach, whatever I need to do, I will do so that I can be off to be at youth group, because I value my spiritual family. And they knew that, and they respected that, and I would go in, and I would do my conditioning by myself at Urbandale High School football field or at the, the baseball field, so that I could be at church. That is what, but putting God first. Maybe it's not children that, that you, you put first, but maybe it's a significant other. And you spend all this time and energy and your thoughts, how can I serve them, how can I love them? You, you spend um, money on them and, and everything revolves around them. Can I remind you that that person could be taken from you at an instant, and now what you've built, and now what you've built your life around could be ripped up from you, and you'll never have it ever again. We have to make Jesus the center. And maybe some of you are like, oh, I don't have a problem with that, but maybe your problem is you. I think the biggest form of idolatry is of self, and it manifests itself in two different ways. One is when we just become selfish. You know, we become selfish where it's like, I'm not going to do anything that I don't want to do. I'm, I'm not going to be told what I, I rarely go out of my way for anybody else. Or, or maybe you have no problem spending money on your hobbies or spending money on the things that you want to do, but it, you just cringe every time a pastor says, we're going to take a special offering for this missionary, or you cringe anytime tithing's brought up. That might be a sign that you love yourself more than you love God, and you love your kingdom more than you love the kingdom of God. The second way it manifests itself as, as idolatry is in insecurities. You say, well, what do you mean? If you live a life that you are, are insecure, and I believe that God will free you of this as you fill yourself with God. If you, if you live a life insecure, what are you doing? Everything that you say, everywhere that you go, the way you look, everything about life revolves and funnels through a filter of how are other people going to perceive me? 
How are people going to see me? But if we can stop trying to earn self-esteem, where, where we're doing things to build and esteem ourselves, and we can start to say, life's about God. And everything that I do and everything that I say, I'm going to do with excellence so that God can get the glory, so that I can esteem God. And we can make life about God esteem and not self-esteem. I promise you, your insecurities will just begin to fall off like broken shackles. You'll begin to walk in just complete freedom. God wants to give that. You don't have to live in, in a moment of just being so just like consumed with, with what others are perceiving about you. You can walk in freedom, but it starts with your relationship with God. Is there someone in your life that has taken priority over God, that you value, that you love more than God? The second thing that we tend to value more than Christ is something. Now, I have more hobbies than most people. I am, you ask my wife, I'm like a hobby uh, a holic. I, I don't even think that's a thing, but I, I am a jack of all trades. I love hunting, I love fishing, I love shooting, I reload, I, I play sports, I love guitar, which is expensive. Uh, did I mention I love hunting? I, I, I love um, music and the outdoors and riding bikes and being with people, and, and I enjoy, you know, watching sports games and, and, and staying, you know, up on, on my teams and stuff. I, I have all these different hobbies, and, and I, I, if I'm not careful, I can allow those things to envelop me, and I become obsessed with, oh, what's the next thing, or what's this, or what's that, and what, what do I need to do to help this hobby, or, and, and I can just get my values just completely out of order. I've, I've described myself oftentimes as a jack of all trades, and, and I appreciate that, and while I value that, because I can relate to just about anybody, you know, if you're into music or you like uh, deeper talk or you're into sports or whatever it might be, I feel like I can relate and God's given me this ability where I can just connect with people about the only thing that I just can't connect with is video games. I just, I don't get it. And it's a good thing because if I did, I would just be all in. But I've come to realize that all of these things that maybe I viewed as a blessing, maybe are really more of a distraction for me. And sometimes I envy the people that are just really, really simple. What do you like to do? Fish. What else? Fish. <laughs> you know? And, and, and I, I, I've started to understand that, man, all of these things that I do and I fill my time with really can serve as distractions. They can be blessings to other people, but the more things that we accumulate, the more time it takes, and therefore the more attention it steals from us. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you how much is too much to spend on your hobbies or how much time is too much time to spend on your hobbies. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. If you pray and you ask God, reveal to me things that I need to neglect, that I need to take out, he'll do that. But I am here to say this. Next time you are about ready to make a purchase for your hobby, and next time you're about ready to spend time on your hobby, next time you're about ready to do something for yourself uh, and, and spend money, why don't you bring God into that equation? Why? Because that shows God honor. It says, God, I honor you because I understand that I have this money that I worked hard to get, but you are the one who put breath in my lungs and enabled me to do that. And so therefore, I would really like to spend this money in this hobby, and I would really like to go here on this vacation. I'd really like to do this. But God, if you're leading me elsewhere, I'm open to that because you ultimately are the source of my life, and you are the source of my income. I never want to get to a point where I just have my way, and, and I can just do it, and I just completely lose the ability to hear God of, of saying, I might transfer this fund. I might transfer this blessing. I might hold this off. Because if you bring God into the center of those decisions, and he says, you know, right now is not the right time. Maybe three weeks later, you run into someone, and they start discussing with you about how they're struggling to, to pay this month's um, heating bill, or whatever it is, and you're able to give, and God prompts you to give. But that will only happen if we bring God into the center of our decisions. And very well, God might say, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's okay to spend that money, but we need to give God honor by bringing him into those decisions and bringing him in, in 
to those. If you're not willing to bring God to the center of your purchases and your hobbies because you're afraid that he's going to put a, a limit or a cap on spending, then it's a sign that you value something more than the main thing, Jesus Christ. And, and if you are more upset when someone dings your shiny car or something happens and one of your properties is damaged, then you are upset about some of the social injustices that are happening around this world. I mean, you've got your priorities mixed up, and, and, and you've, you've got to get a hold of God's heart, because I'm telling you, God doesn't care about your things. God cares about people. And when we grab God's heart and place his heart inside of us, we care about God's people. My dad says this all the time. Most people love things and use people. But I want us to be a church. I want you to be a church, to be an individual that uses things and loves people. Let's get to the point where things don't even matter. We just view them as blessings. And if I can bless someone else, it's greater to be bl- or to bless than to, to be blessed. And I want us to live in that capacity. Are you with me? Someone something, and I don't think this next thing gets talked about enough, but another area where we value Christ, um, where we, we value more than Christ is somewhere. Maybe God has been directing your life, and he's been leading you into a different place, a different season in some realm uh, of your life, and you haven't fully surrendered that. Maybe it's a job for you, you know, and God's wanting you to move into this new role, into this new job, but you're afraid to take a step over because the ladder's not as high. You're, you're afraid to take a couple steps back because um, financially you're, you're already kind of at your, your ends or you're living in there and you, you need this and you've got kids in college and you've got all these different things. Yet we allow our finances, we allow our job, we allow our status We allow the fear of going back to a university. We allow the fear of racking up more debt. We allow those things to get in the way of God's purpose and his plan for your life. We need to value being right where God wants us to be. Maybe it's not a job, but maybe it's a community. Maybe you, you uprooted your, your family and you live in Suburbiaville or whatever, and, and really you know that you're supposed to be back here because you started to build relationships with the coaches and with the teachers and with your neighbors, but the, the education system's better in this district, so we're going to go to this district. But, but really, God's drawing your heart back to these people because that's where he wants you. And your kid is supposed to be light in one of the darkest schools in the city. Let's not be a people that get so comfortable and, and just like we, we draw ourselves to comfort. Maybe God has you where you're supposed to be. I remember at North Central, and I've shared this before, but uh, Dick Brogdon, who's going to be sharing at the missions convention, incredible speaker, get your tickets, don't be a bum. If you need someone to buy a ticket, my dad will buy your ticket too. <laughs> it's my inheritance, I suppose. No, I'm <laughs> um, That's a bad joke. But Dick is speaking at at school, and he says something to this at the end of his service. He says, if God were to call you and your young family and your children to uproot and move to Africa and live in a 600-square-foot apartment, would you do that? And in that moment, I had this check in my heart where I was like, oh, man, that sounds horrible. You know, and so I responded. I went forward to the altar. I was like, God, are you calling me into missions? Am I supposed to learn another language? What's going on here? You know, am I, am I called to the bush of Africa? And God said, no, but I want your heart to always be ready because I want you to go where I want you to go. And as long as your heart is saying, here I am, Lord, send me. Where would you have me? I want your heart to be ready. And that's what I want for each and every single one of you here. It doesn't matter your age. God might be calling you, and you're, you view your season in life as being like the worst season in life to go, but this is actually the best season in life because your kids are adults, and, and they can wipe their own bottoms, you know? And, and now you have the freedom to go. And yeah, it's scary because, you know, your, your 401, you know, account and all of these different things, and financially, it's just you've got this plan and you've got this thing, and God's saying, forget your plan, go with my plan, because my plan's better, and there's people that need you to be there. I was, I, I was, I was uh, sharing last Sunday night with the college-age students, and I was talking about the difference between being right at the center of where God wants you to be versus just kind of by it, like just on the other side of the fence. 
And, and I went to a concert down in Bonner Springs in Kansas. It's an outdoor venue. It's awesome. And I, I, we left a couple songs early to try to beat the crowd because we were driving back late that night. And as I was leaving, I got out in the parking lot, and I'm listening to the song. I'm like, man, I'm going to go to a concert sometime and just hang out in the parking lot. Like, why pay money for the, the ticket? Like, I can just enjoy it out here. But then the more I got to thinking about it, the more I'm like, no, because the real fun was inside. The, the real fun was with the lights and the show and the entertainment and the excitement of, of being with people and, and just being there and present. And I think sometimes when it comes to the plan of God, we have settled for a parking lot experience instead of being right in the midst of where God wants you to be. And even though you can hear the music, and even though you're around God's people, and even though you're close to where you're supposed to be, you're not exactly where you're supposed to be. And I'm here to tell you guys, stop being lip Christians. Let's live as if God really is God. If God's calling you to do something, to go somewhere, to be someone, then do it. Stop talking about it. I don't want to ever be that way. God's been stirring things in my heart that don't make sense in my head. When you write it out on paper, it doesn't make sense. But I know that God's ways are higher and his thoughts are higher. And where God leads you, he's not going to abandon you or forsake you. He will be right there with you, guiding you across the Jordan during the flood season, bringing manna from heaven, having rock, water come from a rock. God will be with you. But we have to follow him. Someone, something, somewhere. The last is someday as the musicians would come. The mindset of loving Jesus someday is a very dangerous mindset and it's a very selfish mindset. It's dangerous in the sense that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Life says, the Bible says that life is like a, a, a mist. It's here one day and it's gone another. And we can make plans and we can, we can, um, just say, you know, oh, once, once I settle down, once I get married, once I have kids, once I do this, we can have all these plans and these intentions, but death is no respecter of your plans. It could come at any time. And I don't say that to scare you into a relationship with Christ, because Christ is the most loving and fulfilling thing that will ever happen to you. And if you're feeling void or empty, come to Jesus because of the life that he gives, not be out of fear. But it's very dangerous to say, oh, someday, not right now, not in this season, not in this time. I'm having too much fun. And the reason why it's a very selfish thing is because God wants to use you in a supernatural way. See, it's, it's very easy to walk through life and you come across someone who has mascara running down their face and you can tell that they've been emotionally disturbed. You know, there's something going on. And I would say that the majority of you, whether you're walking with God or not walking with God, you'd see that individual and maybe you'd stop and console them and put your arm around them and try to figure out and help in the thing. Or you see someone who's hungry. You, you see, um, you know, just whatever need it is. You know, we can see physical needs and even the worst of human beings will respond to those physical things. But I want to be someone who walks with God that I start to see the things that are unseen. I want to see into people's lives, not so I can know their dirt, but so that I can minister in the deep, dark places where they're holding up a mask, but behind the mascara is running. They look like, like they've got it all together and they've got everything, but, but God is revealing things that are unseen. And, and you saying, oh, I'll serve you later, God, is robbing someone of the blessing that you could be through Jesus Christ flowing through your life. I want our church not just to be a church that responds to the obvious needs. I want to, our church to be a church that responds to all needs. And the only way that will happen is when you accept Jesus into your heart. He fills you. He begins to open your eyes to things that, you can, that are unseen. And he begins to open up your ears and you become aware on a deeper spiritual sense. It happens, people. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And honestly, there's probably some of you that's like, I, I was operating in that sense, and I've been there before, but right now I'm just dry, and I haven't been operating in that sense. I used to have God drop things in my heart all the time, but it's been a long time since God has spoken to me and revealed me and used me. Come back to God. He's waiting. His arms are open wide. 
He wants to pour his life. He wants to take his breath, which brings life to the fills, and breathe it into your lungs. So then, therefore, you can breathe that life out on the people that you come in contact with. Let's be a church that has our priorities straight. Let's center our lives around Jesus Christ. If we fail to place our values in the correct order, our family will suffer. You are suffering if you don't have Jesus at the center of your life right now. You might not see it, you might not understand it, but you are. And I want everyone here to experience life that is full, completely full, not lacking in anything. I could come here, I could spend, and I could continue to pour water. I could probably take even more water if I had it. I, I want our jars to be so full. And I'm not talking about full of like sand and water. I'm just saying like, man, let's, let's be so centered that we don't leave anything off the table that God is calling us to do. Would you stand with me this morning? Set aside any distractions that might come before you, whether that's a phone or you just need to set your notes down or... In just a moment, I'm going to invite those responding to come forward, again, as an outward expression of something that's happening on the inside. There's nothing magical about it. There's nothing to be ashamed about. If you respond and you say, you know what, there's things that have been out of my life, uh, out of order and and priority, it's not saying that you don't love Jesus. It's not saying that you're not uh, qualified to teach Sunday school or to preach or to do this or to do that or, or, or whatever it is to lead your family. It's just saying that I I am responding. I'm choosing to place God, and this is a declarative statement. We're going to sing this song declaratively and and say, man, Jesus, I'm going to build my life because I trust you and I trust your plans. Would you close your eyes all across this room out of the respect for your neighbors? God is beginning to, to speak to some people. He's beginning to reveal areas of of your life that have have been out of priority and maybe it's a person maybe it's a thing maybe it's a place maybe it's yourself maybe it's something that i didn't even say but god has has revealed that he's brought that to light and he's saying i'm a jealous god i want your attention and full attention i want you to walk in life and have life to the fullest I want to enable you to do everything that I'm calling you to do. With every eye closed, would you just raise your hand if that's you, if you'd say, Austin, there's something that my, my, my values, my priorities have kind of gotten out of place. Would you just raise your hand all across this room? Yes, yes. Yes. Jesus pray for every hand and every heart in this place, God, that you would give us the power by your Holy Spirit to enable us to love you with all of our heart, God, that we would trust you that as we put you first, that you will take care of all of our needs, just like Matthew 6 says, Lord, we trust you and you will take care of us, Jesus. So give us the power by your strength to hunger and thirst for you in the mornings, to center everything around you. Continue with your eyes closed and head bowed. Is there anyone in this room? I always want to give opportunity to anyone where you feel like, man, I came in here, I wasn't right with God, and and I I feel like I'm apart from God, and if I were to die, I I don't know that I would make it to heaven, and I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart supernaturally. I want to ask him to change my ways, to forgive me of my sins, and that's you this morning with every eye closed and head bowed. Is there anyone here that would just simply raise your hand and make eye contact with me so I can pray for you? saying, I want Jesus to come into my heart and to save me of my sins. Is there anyone here? Yes. 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 Jesus, you see these four hands, you see these four hearts. I pray, God, that you would forgive them in this moment, that they would receive your love, that they'd be washed in your blood, they'd be washed in forgiveness, that the guilt 
would just begin to fall away, Lord, that they would stand in your presence whole and clean, that you'd give them a glimpse of just how much you love them, Lord. I pray that you'd forgive them, that you'd fill them with your Holy Spirit, give them a distaste for anything unholy, and allow them to hunger and thirst for the things of righteousness, the things of God. Save them, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you raise your hand, I, I want to... Uh, meet with you after we respond here. There's a, a fresh start table out there and I've got some materials for you that can help set you on a, on a path uh, towards God. But if you responded this morning, would you join me here at the front as the band begins to sing at the bridge, just declaring that we trust in God so much that we will center our lives around him. And if you're standing in the pews, then I want you to sing this song with all of your heart, with all of your being, and pray that God would be the center of your life. So let's sing this. God, may the proof of our love not be in what we say, but in how we respond to you, Lord. I pray, God, that those are just struggling with keeping you at the center. They wouldn't try to do it by themselves, but that by your Holy Spirit, supernatural power and ability to give them the strength and joy in all that you've called them to do, Lord. God, I pray for those that just feel overwhelmed, feel like they've got too much going on. Pray for those that are searching for value in other people. Maybe they're searching for a rescue from someone else. And they're relying on the strength of man, Lord. I, I pray, God, that you would fill their cup, that you would be their strength, that you would be their peace, that you would fill them up, God. Bless them, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My prayer for you this morning is that we would leave here searching and seeking for the absolute center of God's will. And that will only happen when we put Jesus as the center of it all. There's a song that I absolutely love by Israel uh, Houghton, and uh, I think he's the one who did it. And it says, Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From before time began, it has always been and it will always be you, Jesus. And then it goes on to say, Jesus, the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of this church. Jesus, at the center of the world. And my prayer is that as you go and everything that you'd say and everything that you do, that Jesus would be at the forefront of your minds so that he can receive glory and he can receive praise. You guys are amazing. Thank you for braving, braving the weather. And I just want to pray a blessing over you before you go. God, I, I pray a blessing on everyone here, everyone that's watching online, Jesus. I pray that you'd give them the ability, God, to live as you would have us live and to accomplish the things. I pray against the spirit of fear, but that we would trust in you. We would trust in your nature. We would trust wholly in you, God, and we would respond accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Be safe tonight.